Welcome to a discussion of chapter 37. Your book calls this the plant nutrition chapter, but I'd like to generalize it further and really uh, discuss how it, it will describe how all autotrophs can make their own food. And they're doing this both to provide themselves with energy, but also to eventually build all of the macromolecules that make up their cells. So uh, autotrophs are plants, uh, but they can also be other organisms like algae. Algae are protists, not plants, that are autotrophic. And there are even some autotrophic species of bacteria as well. So we'll, we'll mostly focus our attention on plants, but I want you to appreciate that it generalizes. So we're going to talk about building their carbohydrates first, because that's something they're capable of doing with just a, a very simple ingredients. Uh, you should know your uh, formula for photosynthesis already. It's not going to be something that I, that I make you write out, uh, maybe this unit. Uh, but what do you need to do photosynthesis? You just need carbon dioxide and water chemicals. And with some source of energy, you're capable of creating the basic monomer monosaccharides uh, and also some byproduct oxygen. What kind of energy is required depending, depends on what kind of autotroph you are. You uh, can do it with photosynthesis if you're using some kind of light energy, usually sunlight and natural environments, but we can even grow plants in artificial light environments as well. There are also going to be organisms who are chemosynthetic that we'll see later, so they're just able to break down certain chemicals to provide them with the energy they need to uh, build carbohydrates. So we're going to, again, focus on plants here. Here's a very simple plant diagram. And where do plants get the carbon dioxide and water ingredients in order to do photosynthesis? They're going to get carbon dioxide from the air. And we're going to see uh, where it enters when I zoom in on the, the leaf in just a minute. Uh, there are many plants who don't just do photosynthesis in their leaves. They can do it in perhaps their green stems as well. Wherever they have cells that have chloroplasts is going to be a place that a, a plant can do photosynthesis and needs the raw materials. So carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil. I know sometimes uh, students want to tell me that it rains on leaves and that it might be able to enter the same place carbon dioxide enters, but a plant is really getting its water from the soil, from the roots. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ask you to imagine cutting open a plant stem, uh, looking into what you just cut and zooming in. So you might uh, see a, a, a picture under a microscope with staining that might look like this. And so what I'm really trying to show you are the plant tubes that are inside of, say, a plant stem and even at the plant roots if you're able to look at them. And uh, this overall area right here is what we might call a vascular bundle. Um, this contains the vascular tissue that moves materials around. And there's really two types of uh, uh, tubes that are in a vascular bundle. Uh, the first is xylem. So xylem is going to be the set of tubes that are bigger right here uh, and thicker. Uh, and those are the tubes that are actually transporting water and the stuff that's dissolved in the water from the roots up to the leaves. And the little tiny tubes right around them, uh, all around in here, say, are going to be the phloem tubes that are right around them. We'll talk about why that's important next unit. Uh, but the phloem tubes are going to carry the sugar that's produced in photosynthesis from the photosynthetic centers all around the plant. Uh, remember that there's going to be plenty of plant cells that are below ground here that are going to need access to that sugar in order to keep themselves alive. So they've got to send the sugar down to them, but there might even be some sugar sent up the plant as well, as we'll discuss later. So uh, that's the vascular tissue. Now what I'm also going to do is I'm going to ask you to imagine zooming in on this leaf structure right here. And you might, if you were to really zoom in, see something like this. So here are all the photosynthetic cells with the chloroplasts needed to do photosynthesis inside uh, the leaf here. And uh, what I simply want to point out, uh, they don't show it in the diagram here. I wish they had. Uh, but there's got to be some kind of region where the xylem tubes end and deliver the water. Uh, and where the phloem tubes start and pick up the sugar. Uh, but I want you just to imagine that the, flow, the, the water is coming out the xylem tubes in the leaf veins here. Uh, and then there's going to be little holes where the carbon dioxide gas can come in. 
They're showing you a hole on the underside of the leaf here where these are more common, but there could also be some holes at the top as well. We're going to investigate that in a lab later. Uh, but these holes are called stomata. Stomata is actually the plural here, so if I were just talking about one of them right here, it would be called a stoma, so I'm fine with either term. Uh, but again, the stomata is not the cells around it. The, 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 the stomata is actually the hole itself through which the gas can enter and distribute itself to all the photosynthetic cells. Um, and it's actually going to be a, a hole where oxygen byproduct can also escape. Uh, the plant doesn't actually want the oxygen gas to build up for reasons that we're going to discuss later. And unfortunately, it's also a place where water can evaporate and exit the plant as well. Uh, for some reason, when it's evaporation out of a plant, we, we tend to call it transpiration, not evaporation. Um, and so to prevent excess evaporation, that's what the cells around the stoma are going to be able to do. We call these uh, uh, cells guard cells. And they're essentially guarding against too much water loss from the, from the plant. So they're actually going to be able to be signaled to close if the water loss is getting excessive, uh, say, in really hot, dry conditions. And, and then the plant might decide to open them up later um, to permit gas exchange. OK. This is a, a very different picture um, and kind of a strange picture. So I'm asking you to imagine that this takes place back down at the soil. Um, this might be soil around the plant. And then all of these cells here are sort of root cells um, at the bottom of the plant. Um, how can plants get access to the most water possible? Well, um, as you well know, roots tend to branch a lot and get very thin towards the, the tip of the roots. So that's just a plant's way of trying to maximize the surface area for for obtaining water. But I also want to point out here that almost all species of plants also have a, a mutualistic relationship with species of fungi that are also capable of spreading themselves out. We're going to study fungi more later, but essentially it is the structure of almost all fungi to create this web of threads that reach out often into the soil uh, where a lot of fungi live in order to find their nutrition. And so what we found is that plants and certain species of fungi work together in an overall relationship called mycorrhiza. Kind of a strange word, but uh, very important to me. Uh, the myco is the root word meaning fungus. Um, rhizome or rhiza is a root word meaning root. So it's sort of a relationship between fungi and plant roots where the plants are able to deliver sugar to feed the fungi in return for the fungi extending their, their threads, finding more water and nutrients in the soil, and delivering it through the plant's uh, xylem roots. So a neat little uh, evolutionary adaptation there. OK, so we've discussed how plants can build their carbohydrates with some very basic ingredients. But remember that there are other types of macromolecules too. So how are they capable of building fats? Well, they can take some of those carbohydrates that they've made in photosynthesis. And with many enzyme pathways, they are able to uh, convert some of those carbs into lipids. And they're not going to need any extra ingredients here because, as you recall from chapter 5, carbs and lipids both contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So it's more a matter of just rearranging the, the bonds to form a more hydrophobic lipid. Now, if a carbohydrate also eventually wants to uh, uh, be converted into the building blocks of proteins and nucleic acids, there are going to be some extra ingredients involved. So uh, in order to build proteins and nucleic acids, we're going to need sources of nitrogen, sulfur for proteins, and phosphorus for nucleic acids. So let's talk about where a plant obtains those. If we go back to our picture here, they're going to have to obtain all of that from the soil. When farmers are so concerned with the quality of their soil, what they're really thinking about is all of the other materials that plants need to build their bodies as well, um, especially things like um, nitrates, uh, for example, and phosphates, and uh, sulfates. Those are going to be sources of nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur. You don't need to memorize those. Uh, but the reason why I draw them out is I just want to show you that they all have a negative charge. 
and therefore they're all going to be able to dissolve in hydrophilic water or polar water very well. And so basically when a plant is pulling water up its roots um, to its leaves, it's also able to use water's ability to dissolve things well in order to transport the other nutrients that, it, that the plant cells are going to need in order to build the rest of their bodies. I'd like to take a special focus to talk about nitrogen. This is a very complicated figure that we're not going to spend much time discussing here. Um, the only thing I really want to point out are two things, that there is a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, and we think maybe 80% of our atmosphere is composed of atmospheric nitrogen. And the only thing I want to point out is that that atmospheric nitrogen is very stable. And unfortunately, plants, unlike carbon dioxide that we just talked about, plants are actually able of pulling that carbon dioxide gas out of the atmosphere and fixing it into their bodies in the form of solid sugar. They're incapable of doing the same thing with atmospheric nitrogen. Instead, they're dependent on finding it in the soil, and we have found organisms that are capable of fixing nitrogen from the air into a compound that dissolves in the soil, uh, but the only groups of organisms we've found that can do that are certain species of bacteria. So in that way, I, just I want you to appreciate that the plants are really dependent upon other organisms like these bacteria uh, for providing them for the nutrients that they need. Now, as it turns out, there's some really cool things that certain plants have done in order to maximize their ability to form nitrogen. Uh, we're, we're zooming in here on plant roots, and you can kind of notice that these parts of the plant roots almost look infected or sick. Uh, that's because they have let themselves be infected by these species of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and they're uh, basically allowing them to build a home in the plant roots. Once again, plants can make their own food, so they're going to send uh, sugars um, through their phloem to these bacteria in return for all the nitrogen that these bacteria can fix for them from the air. So uh, this is especially prominent in a species of plant, or in a family of plants, the legume family. Uh, you might see that briefly in your book. And the one way you can just remember that is if you think of the legumes as being the nuts and the beans um, that you consume, those are plant foods that can tip typically contain more protein than the average plant food, and that's simply because they have so much more access to the nitrogen that they need. Another way of getting more nitrogen that's kind of more clever and devious, um, listed toward the end of your book, is to trick other animals into coming toward you and then digesting them. So these are uh, a, an example of a pitcher plant, uh, a plant that uh, fills the bottom of itself with fluid and traps insects as they fly or crawl in there, and then they release digestive enzymes to break them down. Uh, a Venus flytrap does much the same thing, it just snaps shut when it gets the, the signal that a, a, an insect or a worm has crawled up there. And again, they have these digestive enzymes that break them down. And what we think is that they're really interested in the nitrogen sources of these animals uh, to help them build up their own bodies some more. Where do you typically find these types of plants? You tend to find them in tropical rainforests where there are where there is such a high density of plants pulling nutrients out of the soil in order to grow themselves. So this is where you tend to find very nutrient poor soils and where you might imagine there's a selective pressure to evolve other means of obtaining the nitrogen that they need to grow. So very clever. Uh, by the way, where is a great place to find um, all these organisms or to see a bunch of carnivorous plants? Uh, the Atlanta Botanical Garden um, has one of the largest uh, collections of orchids, many of which are the carnivorous plants, um, anywhere in the world. So go visit. Okay, so we've uh, almost finished here our basic survey. We know where they get their carbon. Uh, we know where they get uh, their water with many things dissolved, including things like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And I just want to point out one last little fact, which is if you were to look at the table that's early in the chapter that lists all of the things that a plant needs in order to grow, um, there's many other elements besides just these six, C-H-O-N-P-S. And so what is, what's the purpose of these other micronutrients? Um, and where is a plant getting them as well? They're also getting them from the soil, um, dissolved in the water solution that's headed up to the leaves. Um, and so what's the purpose of all these micronutrients that you don't need to memorize by the way, uh, most of them are coenzymes or cofactors. And so I just want you to appreciate what that means. Uh, coenzymes uh, are simply organic compounds that are important. 
uh, things that contain carbon. Cofactors are simply inorganic things, so maybe just magnesium or maybe just uh, you know, some other element like iron um, in our blood, for example, is a cofactor. And uh, so a cofactor might just be really important to a protein's overall shape. And so we've discussed uh, um, uh, all of the levels of protein structure and folding and bonding, and, and sometimes also just really important to a protein's overall shape uh, might be additional elements that just um, uh, stabilize the protein in a particular way. Um, and so I think they're trying to show the uh, coenzymes and cofactors um, as the little cluster of balls um, uh, in the center of this figure. All right, so we've discussed uh, some very basic ways that plants obtain the nutrients that they need, what they need, where they get it, some very basic plant anatomy that we're going to discuss in more detail in the future. And we've even um, discussed some ways that very clever plants have um, developed in order to obtain more of those things to promote that species' survival.